Next, into the developing political situation in the country. But first, we begin with matters health. Now, it is every parent's wish that the children are born healthy and free of disease. But there are instances where the genetic makeup of two parents pass on genes to their children that may leave them with lifelong diseases. Now, sickle cell disease is one such inherited disease that our Dr. Masi Korid has put special focus on tonight on Health Digest. Dr. Masi. Well, as you have well said, Michelle, sickle cell disease is inherited and no parent wishes that their child would actually get a lifelong disease that is demanding. Well, and this sickle cell disease are, as, has a high death rate, especially for the under fives. And with me this evening to discuss this issue of sickle cell is Dr. Jermaine Makori. Dr. Makori is a pathologist at the Kenyatta National Hospital with a focus on hematology, both laboratory and clinical uh, aspects. She has over five years experience as a pathologist and she has a master's of medicine in pathology. Also with me is Selina Oluanda Ogueno, who is the chairperson of the Children's Sickle Cell Foundation. Uh, she has over 15 years experience in, in project planning, implementation amongst others. She has an MBA in strategic management. And that's where we'd start our discussion at uh, this evening on sickle cell disease. How is this disease inherited? What are the various options that one has or one should be aware of when actually uh, they are at risk of passing on this genetic mutation to their children. And I'll start with you, Dr. Makori. How does one get sickle cell disease? Thank you for the introduction. The disease itself, sickle cell, is an inherited condition. Eh? What the person inherits is a defective gene. Eh? And this has to be inherited from both parents for the, for the person to develop the sickle cell disease. Eh? There are those we call carriers. Eh? These are the ones now who, who inherit part of the gene. They don't have both uh, aspects of the disease. So these ones will not go on to form a novat disease or form the complications of sickle cell. Mm -hmm. Now, the chances of one getting sickle cell will depend whether the parents are carriers or one of the parents is a sickler has the old gene, uh, has inherited the old gene from both parents. Uh. Mm -hmm. So this one changes. Uh, like if you have both parents who are sicklers, who have uh, the hemoglobin SS, as we say, mm -hmm. the, ch the children will inevitably be sicklers, all of them. Eh? Mm -hmm. But if one of the parents has the normal hemoglobin and the other parent is a sickler, there are 25 chances of them getting a child who is a carrier of the hemoglobin, of the sickle, sickle cell, cell gene. Eh? Mm -hmm. But uh, in... Uh, now, the other scenario where you have a sickler with hemoglobin SS and a carrier, now you have 25% uh, chances of getting a one with hemoglobin SS, a full sickler, or uh, than 75% of the remaining children now getting, uh, uh, being carriers of the gene. Eh? Mm -hmm. Now, the third scenario would be if you have uh, a normal parent with a sickler. Mm -hmm. That would be now. The, with a carrier, that would be now the ideal situation where you will only get now 50% uh, will be normal, while, while the remaining 50% the remaining are likely to be carriers. Yeah? Okay. Yes. Now, Selena, you're a parent of a sickler. Yes. What would you say was the most difficult bit for you being told your child is a sickler? Okay. Um. One of the things that I know is uh, from before I knew sickle cell was associated with early death. And uh, for me, at that point, I had never lived or seen somebody with sickle cell. So the day the news was broken down to, was broke down to me that my son has sickle cell, I, it was stressful because I, I remember looking at my child at nine months and asking myself, oh my God, this boy is just about to die. And, uh, I remember crying and not being sure of how to take the news. Mm -hmm. But uh, I must say that uh, with the advancement of technology and also knowledge, I am glad that I learned so much that today if somebody was told that they have sickle cell, I would instead look at it like life, not the same way I looked at it before. Mm. Mm. And, and it's interesting that, uh, well, we don't have policies, guidelines, or clear programs to manage uh, sickle cell disease. You've, you have been a member of the Children's Sickle Cell Foundation. Yes. You've been the treasurer. You've been mm. chair. 
why don't we have programs for sicklers? Okay, the programs are uh, there, but they're not as strong as we are, they're supposed to be. Sickle cell comes into this, uh, people get children with sickle cell, but there's still a lot that needs to be done because we have people within the urban setting, which is here in Nairobi and uh, Mombasa, Kisumu, they are a bit aware. But when you go into the rural setup, it's really bad. Mm -hmm. That is where now you realize that there's a lot more that needs to be done. And worst still is when they go into these facilities, mm -hmm. there's no protocol or anything that can guide the person attending to this patient mm -hmm. to tell them that if this person comes in pain, these are the steps to take. Mm -hmm. If this person has a, uh, maybe an infection, step one, step two, step three. So you find that people, are, it's a matter of trial and error, which we are trying to streamline right now mm -hmm. by just developing relationships with clinics mm -hmm. and also doctors who are friendly so that we can come up with a strong policy that can actually mm -hmm. Uh, help with management of sickle cell anemia. Okay. Mm. Uh, Dr. Makore, she's mentioned that, you know, when one goes to hospital, there's no clear guidelines. But I know from training, there's mm. a clear set way of how you diagnose sickle cell and how you manage it. So we'll start from how does one get a diagnosis of sickle cell? Uh, there are different ways of getting a diagnosis of sickle cell. But in our setup, as a uh, as she says, most of the patients get diagnosed after they get the first complication. We don't have, uh, like in some places, usually the idea would be to, by the time you're having your child, you mm -hmm. should know if it is a carrier or a sickler you're mm -hmm. going to have, so that the management can be taken over from birth. In mm -hmm. some countries, they, are now, they have routine screening of newborns. Mm -hmm. We hope that is where, where we reach. Mm -hmm. Uh, even some African countries, mm. but here in Kenya, what we are doing, we usually wait for the first complication. Maybe the child gets uh, anemia very mm. often, or uh, infections, or they are not, or they are not growing as fast as they should, like other children. Mm -hmm. Then we start now investigating, mm -hmm. and uh, the common investigation is just an examination of the blood cells. Uh, the morphology, looking at the shape of the blood, red blood cells under the microscope, that alone can give you uh, an idea that you're dealing with sickle cell. Actually, once we see that, we start treatment. Mm -hmm. Then there are other tests to confirm. Huh? These other tests for confirmation are the ones that are not available. Mm -hmm. Even here in Kenya, as we talk, there are very few centers that can do HB electrophoresis, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And now, when when parents present with the complications, how bad is it usually by the time they are coming and already the child is complicating, they've been suffering from uh, frequent bouts of anemia or they're in pain, how bad is it usually? Can they be reversed back? Yes, because uh, the disease, as much as uh, there will be sicklers uh, in a group of children, uh, the severity of the disease will be different from one child to another. So once they start getting complications, these complications will be different. Some will come with uh, mm. uh, anemia, they don't have enough blood mm. in their body. Others will come in painful crisis. Others will may present with severe infection. So once you treat now the underlying cause that has led to that crisis, usually the child goes back. Huh? But you understand when they are coming from settings where these complications have been happening repeatedly, it may be difficult because some of the damages cannot be reversed. Mm. Like in case of sickle cell, mm. the complication we fear the most are the strokes. Mm -hmm. When you get uh, cerebral hemorrhages, eh? and the, in such complications are better prevented. Eh? rather than waiting for them, than try to treat them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Selina, what was your experience like now that your child was diagnosed mm -hmm. later? How, how was the management started for your son? One of the things that I thank God for was I was introduced immediately into a support group. And uh, support groups really work. People might think that if I go into a support group, I'll be judged, I'll be what? No, it's the support group that actually lifted me up. And this support group, we sat, talked about sickle cell for so many years. And in that meeting is when you see other people who have faced the challenge. Some have grown. And I remember my biggest inspiration was that there was a gentleman who was in his 30s. And for me, it was like I was putting my truck with him. I'm like, you are 30. My son is getting there. The first thing I ever asked Dr. Wafula Casey, he's the one who saw me, was will I be able to see my grandchildren? 
and I remember him laughing so loudly saying, of course, and why not? And because of that, I started the project of my grandchildren, and I'm still on it, <laughs> proudly. And one of the things that I must say is that through these support groups, you learn a lot. And we are, I'm always encouraging people, sit in groups, get into these support groups. Mm. Today we have evolved into uh, social media kind of support groups. We have a WhatsApp group, we have a Twitter handle, we have a Facebook handle, and we also have a website. Information is here. And this is not sickle cell abroad, it's sickle cell in Kenya. Mm -hmm. So through this, we are finding many people are warming up to this, mm -hmm. and it's actually changing the attitude mm -hmm. and actually taking away the stigma of sickle cell anemia. So what, what have you been able to do at home mm -hmm. for your son so that, you know, they can ah. grow? What are these management practices that you've been taught or that are working for you that other people can copy? Okay. One of the things that uh, we, should, we all know about sickle cell anemia is that you have to constantly hydrate. So it's water, water, water. It's even a song. He goes to school, I have to talk to his teachers, I have to talk to everybody around him that when you are with him, remember to give him drinking water. So safe drinking water, mm -hmm. which is also, uh, it's the first thing. Then the other thing are the daily medications, where we have uh, a combination of medication that they take on a daily basis to just keep them well. Because they are anemic, there are many other things that they go through. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is a healthy diet. And also let him understand that he's a normal child. Most of the time we find that people can take medicine and do all these things, but you find that their mental health is not correlating with what they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. So they don't get to achieve it. Mm -hmm. So also his mental state is something that I constantly evaluate and also through our clinics, I take him so that he's also evaluated just in case he needs to get help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, uh, to Dr. Makori, I know one of the biggest and uh, most tough situations for sicklers is the painful crisis. Yes. And uh, doctors and healthcare providers, I can see you smiling, have been accused of not providing the proper pain medication. Mm. And sometimes these children or these adults need morphine to manage their pain. True. But the healthcare providers have been accused of being reluctant mm. to give morphine in such situations. Is this true? Uh, I wouldn't say that it is a reluctance, but uh, you know morphine is a controlled substance. Eh? Mm -hmm. As much as we use it for pain, eh? even in Kenyatta Hospital, in the clinic where we follow up the sicklers, eh? we don't issue for them morphine to go home. Eh? Mm -hmm. The reason being, we advise them to use other painkillers, eh? such as paracetamol or ibuprofen. Then we advise them. If a child has pain, don't give it the third time, though you're supposed to give it three times a day. No child should go back to sleep the next day still in pain. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to bring them to the hospital. Reason is, these children will feel pain. But if you just control the pain, you may end up missing out on other causes of pain. They are sicklers, but pain can be caused by something other than sickle cell. And that is why it is not advisable to rush to the strongest painkiller available mm -hmm. to mask that pain. You may end up now losing even uh, others to other conditions. Mm. Yes. Selina, you are smiling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a frustration for everybody, even the medical team, when somebody's pain is not going. Mm -hmm. And uh, through the relationships we've made, sometimes as a parent, I always say I'm the first doctor. I'm the one who can tell when this kid when the last time the kid ate, what they ate and all that. Mm -hmm. But I also give credit to the doctors who also try to support us with that. Mm -hmm. The only thing is that in pain management, it's very difficult. Sometimes we already understand how their pain run. Mm -hmm. Because you know that this child, when the pain starts, this is what I need to do. If it doesn't work, maybe I need to just suggest to the doctor that this works better than the other. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, we advise our members, do not manage pain at home first visit a medical facility so that at least they address the underlying issues if it's an infection or whatever. But in pain management, let the hospital be the first one to take care of it. Then after that, mm -hmm. you can take over. The only thing is that sometimes in the hospital, you, you, they look at some doctors look at you and say, who are you to tell me what to do? But you understand some of the things that this child might respond to better to others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and sometimes uh, some of the Providers think that the parents are too fussy, or of, they know is 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 yes, it? Yes, of it? course. You, as a parent, I'm frustrated. I want the pain to go. As in, when that kid gets that pain, I want it to go now. 
I don't want to be told, wait. I understand that sickle cell pain is not that pain that will come and go immediately. You take a paracetamol and it's gone. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we, we know that we have to be patient. But when you're seeing that there's no change mm -hmm. and somebody is telling you to be patient, mm -hmm. trust me, even if you're the most reasonable person, you will find yourself demanding for more. Mm -hmm. And that's why I say that in uh, pain management, yes, we work as a team, but as a parent, we also have to be understood. Mm -hmm. If you think that I'm pushing you too hard, call me aside and let me know I'm pushing you hard and you're trying your best. Mm -hmm. Don't ignore me, mm -hmm. because when you're ignored is when you even get more frustrated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, Dr. Makori, we know that uh, sickle cell if not managed well and early has some complications mm -hmm. that the children or the sicklers may actually get. What are some of these complications that parents should be watching out for? Okay, the, the, compli the most common complications are the crises. Huh? These are now, like what she's talking about, the painful crises. There can be other crises. Eh? It is not only the painful crises. There can be also a plastic crisis, mm. can be hemolytic crisis where you get now breakdown of the red blood cells in the circulation. Mm. But now there are other complications that, uh, that will form and uh, may, be, may take years eh, mm -hmm. before even you notice. Eh? Like uh, the cognitive reduction mm. in the cognitive functions. Mm. When you get silent strokes, eh, there are some mm. small bleeds that happen in the brain and that this can affect now the way the child will grow. Mm -hmm. The mental capacity will be reducing. Eh? Mm -hmm. And uh, the easy way for mothers to, to, to notice that is when a child has been going to school and they've been doing well, then mm -hmm. they start now deteriorating. Eh? Mm -hmm. And you cannot uh, put it to anything specific. Eh? Mm -hmm. The other complications would be the common anemia, the frequent anemia. Mm -hmm. That one is very common. That mm -hmm. is actually what brings most of them. Mm -hmm. Then uh, remember that they have the, the early in the disease, they get, the spleen gets destroyed. Eh? Mm -hmm. And the spleen plays an important, an important role in the prevention or uh, neutralization of uh, pathogens. Eh? So those pathogens now without a functioning spleen get the way now you get frequent infections and commonly meningitis and, pneum and uh, pneumonia. True. That is why they get prevented and they are supposed to take antibiotics. Eh? Mm. Almost every day actually, twice a day for the rest of their lives. Eh? Mm -hmm. Then the other complications are the lung complications. They get complications in their lungs. Mm. The acute chest syndrome, that is a very severe complication. That is also difficult to manage. Eh? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. There are many, but those, those are, are now the yeah, commonest, the that commonest ones that are yes. seen. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Selila, uh, she mentioned that the antibiotics that they're supposed to take mm. are for the rest of their lives. What other medications are your children or the children living with sickle cell okay. on mm. a daily basis? What other medications mm. are they taking? Okay, on a daily basis, they have to take folic acid. This just helps with the generation of the red blood cells. Uh, antibiotics, I can say, stops at a certain point because it's penicillin. Mm -hmm. So they take it from diagnosis, and as the child grows, there's a certain age in which it's stopped. Now, there's also a need for policy at what age do we stop it. Some go up to 18, <laughs> some go up to 15, some go even up to 10. Mm -hmm. But now this is dependent on where you are. Mm -hmm. Some people can't afford it, mm -hmm. so they are forced to stop it early. Mm -hmm. Then we have uh, hydroxyurea which is a very, fun, it's a very good drug, which is also helping them in uh, <clears throat> bringing in uh, the fetal hemoglobin mm -hmm. and also helping in protecting the sickle cell mm -hmm. in the body. And then uh, the other thing we recommend is uh, vaccinations. Mm -hmm. We have the pneumonia vaccination, mm -hmm. we have meningitis, typhoid, and all that. Mm -hmm. So as they grow older, be regular on your vaccinations. Some go up to five years, some go yearly and all that. Mm -hmm. This is what protects the body because mm -hmm. I believe with anemia, mm -hmm. you are just a hub of infection. Mm -hmm. So when you have all this, then we see you are developing well and you are able to go through a day-to-day -day basis without having multiple crises. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And uh, now, as your final comments, I know mm -hmm. many children have been lost because parents believe that uh, it's a curse. Or true. What are these myths that are surrounding sickle cell that are actually not true? Oh, there are many. <laughs> Some of them believe it's witchcraft. Mm -hmm. 
some of them believe that uh, the family could be having some demons they worship who drink their blood. Mm -hmm. Some of them, one of the other myths is that you'll not live to see a certain age. Mm -hmm. I know that the oldest lady in Africa is 92. She turned 92 on 1st of November, mm -hmm. and she's doing quite well. But it's about management and discipline. The other myths that come in is uh, where somebody says this woman is not able to give birth to uh, normal children because of something their family did or owes some other family. There are many things. Mm -hmm. And believe me, myths are innovated. Mm -hmm. So it depends with how best it suits the community or the people talking about it. Mm -hmm. It will always be the woman's fault until she can prove that it's not her fault. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the things that we are trying today to discuss and explain to them and also teach them mm -hmm. that these myths are not true and hence sickle cell is real and it comes from both parents. Mm -hmm. It's not one parent. Mm. Yes. Okay. And uh, Dr. Makori, we know there's a link between malaria and sickle cell that I would want you to explain to our viewers. Yes, the, there is uh, some consider it a, te a theory, but uh, it has been documented that you mainly get sickle cell in areas that are endemic for malaria. Mm -hmm. Like in Kenya, the sickle cell, people who have sickle cell are mainly found in those areas where we, where we have a lot of malaria. This is Nyanza and the coast. Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, but in our clinic in Kenyatta Hospital, the patients we see are mostly and these patients come actually from Nairobi, okay. and uh, they are mostly from Nyanza. But we don't get patients from coast. Maybe they are seen somewhere near coast, maybe near home uh, for convenience. Uh. Mm -hmm. But uh, the lack of registry now mm -hmm. does not allow us. We don't have a registry to locate where sickle cell is in Kenya exactly, in the, uh, the, prevalent, the exact prevalence for us to know like there are some areas in Kenya where malaria is not an issue, so you wouldn't expect to get sickle cell there or okay. to get carriers. Okay. Initially, it was thought that it was actually a way of nature to prevent those people who live in those areas from getting malaria. Mm. Because once these cells are changing, there is no room for the parasite. Mm. But it is still a theory, so it has not been proven. Mm. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, we'll end it there. Thank you, ladies, for your time this evening, for at least trying to debunk some of these myths on sickle cell, explaining to us the inheritance on sickle cell. And I could see one of our viewers who was asking uh, that if both parents are carriers, what are the chances of uh, children having sickle cell? So I'll just recap this. Dr. Makori had given us a brief on that. And if both parents are carriers, then it means they have a 50% chance of having uh, children who are carriers, 25% uh, chance of having a normal child, and 25% chance of having a sickle. That means one in four of their children will have sickle cell disease, two in four will be carriers of the defective gene, and one will be normal. And that's where we'll end this discussion tonight. I was with Dr. Jermaine Makori, who's a pathologist at the Kenyatta National Hospital, uh, Selina Oluanda, who's the chairperson of Children Sickle Cell Foundation. And from me, that's all we had for you this evening on Health Digest until next Saturday, where we discuss yet another topic that affects your health. Uh, stay tuned. We take a short break. Michelle Ngele will be back with the state of Kenya. Stay tuned.